Hello and welcome to CMC Markets on Thursday the 11th of July and a special edition of a Market Update. Um, this is one of my fairly regular chats with my friend Megan Green from Maverick Intelligence about the events that have taken place over the last three to four months in Europe and the and EU leaders' attempts to try and resolve the crisis in Europe, the growth crisis in Europe, the unemployment crisis in Europe. Now, the last time Megan and I spoke, Italy didn't have a government, Cyprus was on the brink, and they were essentially front and centre with respect to the latest events in Europe. So we're going to really have a quick look at how much has changed since then, um, what the likelihood is as to whether or not we'll actually make it past the German elections without a significant blow up and the prospects for banking union. Um, there are four pillars to banking union. Um, Megan had the opportunity the other day to talk to Jörg Asmussen, one of the ECB uh, council members about that and it will be interesting to get her views on that. Mr Asmussen's views on that, second hand from Megan of course. and. Um, the prospects of monetary policy, ECB, and as to whether or not they can mitigate any of the stresses and the strains with respect to fiscal and monetary policy going forward. Let's start with the Italian government, or Italy. Now, the last time Megan and I spoke, Italy didn't have a government, now they do. Um, but fundamentally, nothing really has changed with respect to the Italian fiscal situation, debt to GDP ratios are continuing to ratchet higher, as is unemployment, and growth is sinking back. IMF downgraded Italy's growth forecasts earlier this week. S&P downgraded their sovereign credit rating. What's the prognosis there, Megan? I mean, I think if you look at the Prime Minister Letta's program, it's actually really not that different from Monti's program. And we saw with Monti, it was so difficult for him to actually get anything through um, the government without it being hugely watered down. Um, and and uh, you know, what comes to mind is the labor market reforms. Um, there's no real reason to think that Letta is going to do any better, particularly given how unstable his coalition is. So the second that Berlusconi feels like he might do better in an election um, than he did the last time he's going to pull his support or the second he feels like it's not in his best interest to, to remain in the coalition he's going to pull his support and and will end up um, either with a technocratic government or or a new election so you know I'm not very hopeful that Italy all of a sudden um, is going to be implementing all these difficult structural reforms so that it can finally um, return to sustainable growth one day I think that was the um, argument that Beppe de Grillo was making and I think it's interesting to know that actually he has lost significant amount of support and I think if that sort of train continues in terms of Mr Grillo losing support I think you'll find the politicians might feel emboldened to go for a new election if they can get you know a significant majority and a new government. Absolutely. I mean, it also is worth looking at um, who's gaining at Beppe Grillo's losses, and it's largely Berlusconi's party. So, um, you know, like I said, if Berlusconi feels like he can do well in a new election, um, he'll, he'll pull the plug on this government. Um, so this government is trying to push through really difficult reforms that will be very unpopular, will, you know, force Italy's unemployment rates up further. Um, if you look at um, youth unemployment, not just as, as youth unemployment, but as those who are not in education um, or training, actually Italy is the highest. Um, in Europe in terms of youth who aren't working and aren't, aren't tr trying to gain skills. It's actually higher than Greece. So that it's a huge problem. So, you know, that needs to be addressed, but the, the way to open up the labor market um, will require short-term pain. Um, and this is a very unstable government that has um, a huge challenge in front of it. Yeah, they don't have a monopoly on unstable governments though, do they, Italy? I mean, um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Portuguese government is hanging by a thread. Um, the finance minister resigned um, simply because there doesn't appear to be any appetite to implement any further austerity. Now the EU have relaxed budget targets but I think your view is that that's not going to make a jot of difference is it? 
No, I don't think so. I think it just means that <clears throat> the adjustment that these countries um, are making it, it will be sufficient to maybe come closer to the targets, but it doesn't mean that they're making a smaller adjustment, unfortunately. We've got the Troika review on the 15th of July for Portugal. Um, a lot's been made of the debt sustainability argument and the IMF's role in this. Now, the IMF have just signed off on the latest release for Greece and the bailout tranche there, um, despite the fact that Greece continues to miss its targets. Massive social unrest there, strikes, they're going to have to get rid of another two to three thousand public sector workers in Greece. Um, we're about two months away from the German elections. I'm going to try and group Greece and Portugal together because I think they're probably similar sort of stories and they could probably blow up in the next couple of months. Um, do you think the Troika review will fudge Portugal's debt sustainability in the same way they have Greece's? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the Troika is going to be lenient <clears throat> in this review, even though Portugal is missing quite um, a few of its targets, particularly given that the government's really hanging by a thread and the Troika's in best interest is in keeping that government together. Um, so I think that they probably will be pretty relaxed in this review, um, just as they have been for Greece. I mean, it's, it's in Germany's best interest in particular to keep the wheels um, on this, this car <laughs> um, through the German elections on September 22nd. So I, th I do think that the Troika will do everything it can to support also a new government. I mean, in a way, um, they've, they've rejigged the coalition um, in Portugal. Um, you know, you've got a bit of a new government in Greece as well, and that, in that that coalition has been rejigged. And I think that the Troika will feel they need to give these new constellations a chance. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that does make sense. It doesn't change the underlying dynamics, but I think it keeps, as you said, it keeps the um, it keeps the wheels on the uh, wheels on the car, if you like. Which brings me on to Spain. Now, you know, sort of Spain has dropped out of the spotlight to a greater or lesser extent. Um, the EU looked at the Spanish banking sector and rather laughably signed off. You know that you know the Spanish banking sector was, you know, looking in much better shape. I don't buy that. And now, of course, you've got the Spanish government, in particular Mr Rajoy, embroiled in a corruption scandal and the possibility that you might see calls for new elections there. The Fed tapering programme has helped push bond yields up, not only in Portugal, Greece, Italy, but also Spain. Is that going to be a problem or are these countries sufficiently funded going forward to be, be able to ride out slightly higher yields? So the question, I guess, is it's a question of time. So how long can they ride out these um, higher yields for? They could actually ride them out for quite a long time, um, particularly you know, Spain and Italy have pretty long um, average maturities for their debt. So they can afford to fund themselves um, at elevated levels for a while. And these aren't the most elevated levels we've seen them at. Um, you know, last summer we had Spanish two-year yields you know, up at 7%. This isn't the same thing at all, um, but it will be expensive for them. I think in Spain, the corruption scandal is, is one of many. Um, and when you speak to Spaniards about it, the first thing they say is, well, this is no surprise at all, and I imagine there are more skeletons to come out of the closet. And I think that's indicative of the level of sort of public trust in government. Um, it's, it's extremely low in Spain, in most of these peripheral countries, actually. Um, and, and it's hard to have functional institutions when the public doesn't trust their politicians at all. And you need functional institutions to be able to push through these reforms. Yes, yeah, speaking of functional institutions, um, brings me on to banking union. Now, there's been an awful lot of chatter about that and the four pillars of banking union. And I have to say, when I hear banking union, my sort of eyes glaze over a little bit because you've got SSM, you've got SRM. Germany is in favor of banking union, but it's on, on its own timetable. How likely do you think that we're gonna see any form of banking union before January next year? Um, you know, we might have the SSM in place, the single supervisor mechanism, um, not by January of next year. What exactly does that mean? Because I must admit, I do struggle with all the acronyms and getting the, getting the order right. So we'll have the ECB supervising the 150 biggest banks in Europe, not by January, but they'll have at least um, taken some steps um, to, you know, look at 
at asset quality reviews um, because the ECB wants to know exactly what it's taking over before it commits to taking over, um, and rightly so. Um, that being said, you know, some people are really hopeful that we're, we're finally going to clean up Europe's banks, um, but the ECB is never going to announce a number that's bigger than what the banks and their governments can afford in terms of recapitalization needs. So, um, you know, there's a big risk that this stress test and asset quality review um, could be fudged, and that would be a huge missed opportunity, I think. Um, but, you know, I think actually you're wrong. I don't think Germany wants a banking union at all. Um, but I think that they feel like they're, you know, they, they don't have much choice. And so what they end up agreeing to is going to be precisely on their terms. And I don't think that's going to be a banking union so much as a, you know, a banking loose federation in a way. So we've seen the agreements that they've come up with so far in the banking union. Um, there's very little actual risk sharing involved. And that, that was supposed to be underpinning the banking union as it's sort of a backdoor way to get at a fiscal union. There's no burden sharing other than through 60 billion euros of ESM money, which is, is woefully little and will probably never be used. So um, I think it's a bit of a banking disunion given that you know, bail-ins were always an option in Europe, and we didn't use them because of cross-border exposures. It's only now that we've unwound all those cross-border exposures that we can, you know, contemplate having bail-ins. Um, but, you know, the balkanization of Europe's financial services, um, that, that's not equated with a banking union, really. It's exactly the opposite. When, when I was at this conference that you were a moderator on, Asmussen said, and I'm pretty sure I heard him right, but I'm sure you're going to correct me. He said bailouts are out and bail-ins are in, i.e. the Cyprus template model is going to be the model going forward essentially so that hair cutting depositors over 100,000 euros is on the table. Is that accurate or is that, did I slightly misunderstand that? So I think what he said was that bail-ins aren't necessarily in and bailouts aren't necessarily out. I think they'll both be used going forward. Um, they've set up a hierarchy that, that does follow the Cyprus template, absolutely, um, so that you know insured depositors um, under 100,000 euros will be protected. Um, and then there's some flexibility on who, you know, who exactly gets bailed in. Um, banks will have to bail in up to 8% of their total liabilities before a bailout can be used. Um, but, you know, different countries can choose to some degree which uh, creditors are bailed in. And that means that there's going to be a big difference um, if your money is kept in a German bank versus a Greek bank. Um, there, it sort of exacerbates the difference between the haves and the have-nots, which once again wasn't the point of a banking union. So it just basically makes things an awful lot more uncertain. Depending on the country you're in, different rules will apply. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And that's why I say, you know, between the fragmentation and balkanization of Europe's financial services and, and this um, accentuation of the difference between wealthy and weaker countries in Europe, um, I, I don't think we're going to see cross-border exposures really come back. Um, and, and that's what a banking union was in part supposed to achieve so that a bank in Greece and a bank in Germany um, weren't necessarily equal because there are inherent risks anyhow, but, um, but were more equal if you were a creditor. Okay, so assuming that they don't have a banking union and a banking union is a long way away, then how are EU leaders ever going to break this doom loop between sovereigns and banks and unlock the credit channels in Europe that you need to basically get growth back on the agenda, get unemployment down and essentially get Europe out of the funk that it's in right now? Because the ECB is not going to print money, certainly not before the German elections. I mean, I don't think that they could probably do it afterwards unless they changed the mandate or fudged it in any way. What are the next steps? Because the way I see it um, is that we're heading for a very, very big train wreck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you're stands to contract um, going further. I mean, in terms of unlocking the doom loop, um, bail-ins to some degree are, are addressing that. Um, but that's one half of the doom loop 
where you know banks take down their governments. The other half, where um, you know governments become reliant on their banks to buy up all their sovereign debt. That part's not being broken, and policymakers don't want to break that part because it's the only way that governments can actually fund themselves these days, especially in the weaker countries in Europe. So, um, so there's no intention to break that part of the doom loop. Um, but you know, to to finally have unemployment stabilize or to get you know lending to SMEs. Um, I, I think one thing that they are doing is they're loosening some of the fiscal targets. Um, we could see more of that, particularly given that France is about to miss all its targets by a mile and has not made a secret of that at all. Um, and so if we have one of the bigger core countries totally missing its targets, they might start looking at structural deficits um, as opposed to general ones. And the beauty of a structural deficit is nobody can define it. So there's a ton of wiggle room inherent in that. Um, so, you know, that could help a little bit on the margins um, to get, you know, companies actually um, being able to borrow and invest. Um, I think the ECB <clears throat> will have to step in there. Um, so far, they don't want the risk of it. Um, but that could change if things got really bad. Um, we could see the ECB, um, you know, they've just uh, implemented some forward guidance, but they could also, you know, cut the deposit rate um, into negative territory. They don't want to do that either at the moment, but again, that could change. Do you think cutting the deposit rate to negative would help the way I see it? I think that could drive rates higher. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, we've seen it in Denmark, for example, where banks just pass through um, the higher costs to their customers. Um, but a negative deposit rate would have a positive um, effects result for Europe in that the euro would, would weaken. And that's what we need to see. Um, we've seen it a little bit given recent events, actually, but we need a euro that's, you know, at parity with the US dollar. And we're a long way off. Well, that's not going to happen, is it? No. Not I with, you know, the, well, I suppose it could happen if the Fed does taper and then starts to push interest rates up. But do they really want that? especially when you've got U.S. companies complaining about the fact that the dollar is um, becoming a little bit too strong and it's dragging on their earnings. No, that's right. I don't think we'll see that happen. It's one of the, you know, one of the things we would need to see for growth to return to Europe in the short term. Um, but like I said, I don't think growth will return to Europe in the short term. Final question. German elections, September. Do you think you'll see a policy shift from Germany after that date? Um, that's a great question um, that not enough people are asking. I think there's an inherent assumption in London, at least, with the clients I speak to, that there will be a big policy shift after the elections. Um, I think that's wrong. Um, regardless of the composition of the German coalition, it may end up being the same coalition, actually. But we could have a grand coalition as well. I think if you, you know, look at the SPD's headlines, they're much more euro friendly. But if you speak to senior SPD members about the details of things like a banking union or euro bonds, um, actually, they're not that different from the CDUs. So, uh, you know, either way, I don't think we're going to see a big shift in policy from Germany after the election. Okay. All right. Well, that's it for this quarter. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll probably be talking about the same things after the German elections. Actually, I think that's an idea. I think after the German elections, we'll have you back and we'll talk about potential policy changes going forward from there. We might get a better idea. We may not. It may just be the status quo. But anyway, that's it for this quarter. My thanks again for Megan for sparing her time. Um, until September or maybe October. <laughs> Um, thanks to Megan and uh, thanks to you guys. Until then, this is Michael Hewson and Megan from Maverick Intelligence talking to you from CMC Markets.